All right, welcome back. This will be video 18, New Testament Context. We're starting at Matthew 13, 36 to 43. I just want to make one comment on that Psalms, uh, that quote on Psalm 78, 2 in the previous verse. I don't know if I made the connection so much, but he was talking about, I will dig up what has been kept secret from the foundation of the world. And I wrote on there, the context of secrets or mysteries connect the fact that Christ existed before the foundation of the world and he chose the posterity of Abraham and in and, and these prophecies, which is the whole point. He's, he's quoting all these prophecies about himself, telling him to go look in uh, Moses, the prophets and Psalms about all the things that uh, <clears throat> apply to him so that they can uh, believe that he's there, I guess, would be the best way to say it. So, at any rate, in case I didn't make that clear. All right, uh, 3643, I wrote Christ's explanation of the wheat versus the tares, which he gets down to the uh, sower, of course, is, is Christ. The perfect seed is the 12 tribes from Abraham. He always says, I'm the God of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. The uh, twelve tribes redeemed, which is in Revelation, of course, twelve seventeen and fourteen three and four, which we've covered, and also uh, we just actually uh, went over Exodus nineteen six, uh, just a couple video or two ago. Same thing with First Peter two four to twelve. Uh, hmm. We're doing the First Peter two. Yeah. Okay. Yep. We uh, briefly mentioned that, but we've gone through it before a couple times. So those are his chosen, basically the elect, the redeemed, versus the wicked seed, who the sower is the devil and the sons. I said would be synagogue of Satan. Actually, Jews against Christ plus synagogue of Satan. I think the synagogue of Satan's a slightly different group of people because it's more modern day. I don't know how many people you could point to today saying uh, they were Jews against Christ in the context of House of Judah. So that's the whole point. Most of the ones today, as I pointed out, are Ashkenazi and Shephardim. And how many of those are actually uh, from House of Judah? Well, none from the Ashkenazi group. And as far as I can, and there's multiple groups, but as far as I know, it's the uh, most prevalent. So uh, they have no connection to uh, the 12 tribes at all from uh, their background. So they're just proselytes. So it's just a big mess. At any rate, you can read the, the idea of that in Revelation 2, 9 and 3, 9. And then uh, 1344 to 52. Let's just go on to that. Yeah, well, in the, the end of that 43 there, it says, uh, Then the righteous shall shine out like sun in the kingdom of their father. So uh, after he does away with uh, throwing these others in the furnace of the fire. So the point is, and we're going to see this multiple times. Well, well, that is the rapture right there. Actually, that's the rapture of the wicked. Because at the end, he keeps the... Uh, the good and gets rid of the bad. In other words, he doesn't take the good off of earth. The people uh, who he's going to keep are going to stay here. New Jerusalem's coming here. So we talk about going, uh, being raptured to heaven, but actually uh, New Jerusalem's coming here and it will be right here on earth. That's the description and the the way it lays it out in Revelation and it gives you the size of New Jerusalem and it tells you all about it. And it tells you these other people will be coming up to New Jerusalem and, and just more than you could want to know about the fact that New Jerusalem's here. It's not off of this earth. Yes, there'll be new heavens and earth and I, I, I get all that. But we'll cover that when we get to it. <clears throat> 1344 to 52. It goes over more parables. It's uh, king of heavens compared to a buried treasure. Merchant on the lookout for valuable pearls. Kingdom of Heaven is like a dragnet spread in the sea, collects all kinds. 
and then sitting down they select the good and the baskets to cast the bad away. Thus it will be at the completion of the period, that's judgment day, the angels will pick out and carry away the wicked from the midst of the righteous and throw them into the furnace of fire. So the righteous will stay here again. Same idea, which we see multiple times. So that's uh, oh, 44 to 52. And, and the interesting thing here, uh, he asked, Christ uh, asked them if they understand that, the disciples. He, and they say yes. He says, uh, Every teacher who has been trained into the kingdom of heaven is like one who is the master of a house who brings out from his stores what is new as well as what is old. I don't know how people teach that, but to me, uh, the stores, for a teacher, in other words, the stores are his word. In other words, uh, the knowledge of his word is what you've stored up in your brain, in other words, so you're bringing out what's new as well as what is old. I, to me, that's saying that you're bringing out what's in the New Testament versus what's in the and what's in the Old Testament as well, and then you're connecting the dots between the two. I mean, that's basically what he does. He gives you all these prophecies. He tells you about all these prophecies. He gives you these quotes back to the Old Testament, connecting what he's saying at the time he was talking to them to what's already in there, what they've already read. Of course, they had read anything in the New Testament at that point. They're looking at him. He's telling them, look, this is uh, all about the kingdom of heaven. And he's teaching it from the Old Testament. So everything you want to know about Christ, the kingdom of heaven, it's all in the Old Testament, Moses, the prophets, and Psalms. It's not all here, although uh, being able to connect what is said here to these prophecies in the Old Testament is what gives you a, more of a complete understanding of what's the context, of, in other words, of what's being said. Because... Like I said before, you can figure out the con if you can't figure out the context back there, the fact that the, you're linking to it from something here in the New Testament back to this prophecy uh, helps you sometimes to figure out what the context of that prophecy uh, really is. Sometimes it's not that simple. So uh, connecting the new to the old and teaching both of them together is the way the Bible should be taught. And, and there's so many quotes back to the old, I don't know why anybody wouldn't teach it that way anyway, but apparently we don't necessarily, so I think that's what it's saying. Uh, I wrote on there, King of Heaven is the final separation in the end time, when he separates the good from the bad, which is the end time, at Judgment Day, of those approved by Christ versus the synagogue Satan, specifically chosen for destruction from among the heathen, for blasphemy against the Spirit of God, uh, versus other heathen who, who survived. So basically, obviously the people, he's, he's uh, the tares would be heathen, if you want to look at it that way. Whether they're house of Judah or not, they're still, if he's burning them in the fire, then that, that's heathen he's getting rid of. Versus uh, other people who survive at the end time to be governed under God's law by the 12 tribes from New Jerusalem, which is the way it's going to happen. Now, uh, we'll go back to Romans uh, 9.22 and kind of look at that because uh, that is the whole point. Uh, what did I say? 9.22 and 23. Yeah, well, that's uh, what I was saying right there. 22 and 23 is the good versus the bad, and we just covered that recently. You read that again. And then Revelation 2.26. So let's bump over there. The conqueror also and the keeper of my institutions to the end. In other words, those that follow his law, teach it and teach Christ. To him I will give a governorship over the heathen. He shall shape them with an iron rod as vessels of clay are tempered together as I myself was instructed by my father and I will present to him the morning star of course he's the morning star okay so uh, oh got the wrong one uh, 26 12 uh, 5 and 1915 okay.
And she bore a son, a man who will rule with an iron rod all the nations. And her child was conveyed up towards God and towards his throne. And of course, that, that's uh, Christ. And of course, we've been through Revelation multiple times. That's Sarah is talking about. She bore a son. So basically it's saying that Christ came from, of course, we know the prophecy from uh, Judah. And originally, uh, Judah and the 12 tribes came from Sarah and the promise was to Sarah because of the 12 stars just above and the woman that was the uh, context of that was from the uh, prophecy of uh, Joseph so we've covered that and then in 1915 so again rule with an iron rod 1915 and it had a sharp sword drawn from a sheath so that with it he might smite the heathen and he will govern them with an iron rod, tread the wine press of the fury of the indignation of the all ruling God. And he's the king of kings, lord of lords, so on. So, same thing. Ruling with an iron rod, and then of course, uh, uh, he brings the 12 tribes back, redeemed, and they rule with him from New Jerusalem. That's the context of all the scriptures. Isaiah 61. <sighs> Five and nine. Then the stranger shall stand and shepherd your flocks. Sons of strangers shall plow and shall garden, and you be called priests of the Lord. So there's your kingdom priests. Your title, the servants of God. So there's your kings and priests from Revelation 1 6, which ties them to the kindred people, and so on and so forth. You shall feed on the wealth of the heathen, or some say Gentiles, and rule over their pride. So he's telling you, uh, the priests of the Lord will rule over the pride of the heathen. Instead of your shame and your double disgrace, cheer when you spoil them, when you double, you season their land, for you to lasting pleasure will come. For I am the Lord loving justice. There you go. Justice system. It'll be a righteous justice system. And plunder and crime I detest, so I give them the wages they earn, but make lasting my treaty with you, and your race shall be known to the heathen, or Gentiles, and your shoots in the midst of the tribes. All who see them will treat with respect. So uh, that's your offspring, in other words, children, as the race that is blessed by the Lord. So, and then of course, uh, right below, you've got the bridegroom, the bride decked with the gems. Earth shoots up her plants or crops. So the 12 crops in Revelation 21, same thing, your offspring. And then you just continue on. And when to you, you're given a new name, that's 62 2. You'll be a beautiful crown, the head of the Lord, an imperial staff in the hand of your God. So, same people, the bride the Lord loves, verse 4, that's 62 4. And just continue on. He talks all about the standard. The people set free, blessed, sought for, the town not forsaken. That's back from Hosea, which we just went through earlier. So, same people ruling over the earth with a proper justice system based on God's law. That's the context. So Daniel uh, 12, 3. Yes. And many people sleeping in the dust of the earth will awaken some to everlasting life, some to everlasting shame and contempt. So wheat versus tares. But the teachers will shine like lights in space, or stars in space. And those who have led me to righteous like stars. Forever and ever. So, there's your crown of 12 stars from Revelation chapter 12. And then Philippians 2.15. Well, let's just start in 12. So then, my beloved, as you have at all times been obedient, not only when in my presence, but much more now in my absence, 
Work out your own salvation amidst fear and terror, for God is energizing in you both to will and to do for the sake of his approbation or his approval. Do all without grudging and dispute so that you may become blameless and pure and beautiful children of God in the midst of a deformed, degenerate race among whom you will shine like bright lights to the whole world, possessing a reason for life, to my delight in the day of Christ. Yeah, okay. So, same context. Let's, uh, oops, drop one. Alright, so the next one will be 1353 to 58. Well, that's when Christ went back to his own country, it says. Taught in that son of God, and then they basically uh, looked at him and say, "Oh, we know this guy. He the son of that carpenter." <clears throat> so the son of that carpenter means his father was a carpenter. I know we call him a carpenter, but uh, here it's really talking about his father. So not his mother called Mary and his brothers, James, Joseph, Simon, and Judah, and, and his sisters. So where did he attain all this? And they were embarrassed concerning him. So he says, the prophet is not without honor except in his own country, in his own house. He didn't display much power because of their unbelief. So, I uh, point to Mark 6, 1 through 6. Same thing, came to his own country, his disciples followed him. And when the Sabbath came, he began to teach. But many who heard were struck with admiration, exclaiming, where does he obtain this? What is the wisdom given to him? And how could such result come from his hands? Is not this fellow the carpenter, the son of Mary? And only the brother of James, Joseph, Joseph Judah, and Simon, Sisters are here, so on. The prophet is not designer except in his own country, among his relatives, in his own house. It says he cured a few sick people by laying his hands upon them, and he wondered at their disbelief. But he transversed the surrounding villages. So, since people knew who he was, they couldn't believe that, uh, well, I guess we can. I understand that since Luke uh, 414 uh, 14 30 okay. over here he quotes Isaiah 61 1. At any rate, it says he returned to Galilee. The power of the Spirit and his reputation spread. He taught in synagogues with approval. Afterwards, he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up in the synagogue. And he was handed Isaiah, and he opened and read, uh, basically, Isaiah 61, uh, 1 and 2. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, by which he has appointed me to tell the good news to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, proclaim freedom to the enslaved, restoration of sight to the blind, set at liberty those who are oppressed, proclaim the year honored by the 
the Lord, rolled up the book, and said, This day the scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. And I said, Is not is this not the son of Joseph? He says, You will repeat this parable to me. Physician, cure yourself. Whatever we have heard that you have done in Capernaum, do also here in your own country. But he added, I tell you, indeed, a prophet is never acceptable in his own country. And then he goes on and it makes them mad and they try to kill him. <laughs> so, uh, All right, then uh, that wraps that. No, uh, wait, John uh, 642. All right. So he's talking, telling him that he's uh, bread coming down out of heaven, that he's the bread of life. If you just back up. As will restore them at the last day. And they say, Is not this fellow Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How then can he say, I, ca I came down from heaven? And he just says, No one's able to come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will restore him at the last day. It is written in the prophets, and they shall all be taught from God. And that's Isaiah 54:13. So, he continuously just gives them prophecies and says, hey, I'm fulfilling these prophecies. And they don't believe it necessarily because they know him. Yeah, uh, hmm. Well, we were here before. You afflict, let's start in 11. You afflicted by storms and unpitied. This is Isaiah 54, 11. Your stones shall be marble foundations, be sapphires, rubies, your windows and gates of rock crystal. He's describing New Jerusalem. And your ramparts of beautiful stones, your entries. And the Lord teach your sons and well prosper your children. Be steadfast and right, keep far from oppression, to it and corruption, you never must look. You must not bring them near you. And then so on. All tools formed against you shall never succeed. You shall conquer all tongues that rise up in contention. The Lord's servants have this right from me to conquer all that rise up against you. In other words... So, there's a concept of unalienable right, and that's the idea of the standard right there. There's more here with the stuff that we need to read at this point. So, he's quoting that in John. About people who don't uh, believe him. He's saying, I'm this person, they're going to teach uh, the ch children or the posterity of the 12 tribes in, in, in the end time. So he keeps quoting these things. Really, that's an end time context, though. If you want to go back and look through it. He says, I'm the guy. I'm the, of course, he uses these parables that they have a hard time or there's uh, allegories they have a hard time with. And, and I agree, uh, some of that... You'd look at that and, say, and why would he use that particular parable or that allegory and so forth? I don't know. I don't see how it helps to uh, teach his word, and let's put it that way. All right, so 14, 1 to 12, this is about Herod uh, killing, beheading John uh, the Baptist. And it's uh, repeated in Mark uh, 6.14, and basically uh, John uh, told him it was a 
his, his marriage to uh, his brother's uh, wife, I guess, was against the law. The law he's quoting is uh, Leviticus 18, 16, 20, and 21, if you want to look that up. So Mark uh, 6, 14, we were actually just there. So, but they're speculating about uh, this uh, Christ's person who's uh, casting out uh, demons and so forth, creating these disciples and, and all this. And they're speculating that it's John the Baptist or he's a prophet or somebody like the prophets and so forth. Later on, if you look up in, about Herod, uh, and of course this is the second Herod of the son, uh, he uh, plot, says he plots also to kill Christ. Well, his father, you know, that's the other problem. His father killed all these children to try to kill Christ as a baby, and yet uh, here he is. So they thought that they did away with him. It's not that they don't know all these prophecies. In fact, we'll see as we go along, they know all these prophecies about Christ. So they're assuming that he's not going to show up because they basically killed him as a child. That was their thought. And in fact, here he is and they're saying, but no, it, this can't be him because uh, it was supposed to, they, of course they know the prophecy is supposed to come from Egypt and be a Nazarene and all this. So I said, well, this, we know you and so you don't fit all these prophecies, is what they're saying. So they're thinking that, you know, but they can't dispute the fact that he's healing people with a touch and raising people from the dead eventually. And they see that too, and then they just can't deny it. At any rate, let's go on to 14, uh, 13 through 21. Christ feeds 5,000 men and others on five loads, loaves of bread and two fish with 12 bags left over, producing the evidence of a miracle for the crowd, besides curing uh, all their illnesses, I think that's what it said. So let's look at that, 14, 13. Okay. So let's look at... Uh, what John says about it, because we, we all know this is repeated throughout uh, the other ones, Mark and Luke, but let's look at John uh, 6 specifically, because over in John 6, 1 to 14, talks about the same thing. And there were, says a large crowd was falling because they saw the wonders which he effected upon the sick people. So they had seen him healing people. It says the Passover was near. It's just one of the last things he did. we get down to the end. Then when the people saw the evidence which he produced, in other words, uh, feeding them from these few uh, loaves of bread and fish, they exclaimed, this must certainly be the prophet who was to come into the world. So there's no quote here, but they understand that there's a prophet who was to come. Now, uh, basically, uh, that starts, and I wrote on there, Genesis 49.10, which we've looked at, I think we've been through Deuteronomy 18.15, uh, as well, I say the Deuteronomy one that we have, but uh, we probably did. Let's just sit back there. If you're ever living, God will raise a prophet like me for you from among your brothers after me. Listen to him. You all requested one from your ever living God at uh, Mount Oreb on the day of the public meeting saying we cannot continue to hear the voice of the ever living God no longer see this great fire so they're at Mount Sinai and then the Mount of Oreb is uh, a short distance away for fear of death <laughs> when the ever living replied to me in other words Moses 
what they have said is good. I'll raise for them from amongst their brothers one like you, and will put words in his mouth, and he shall report to them all I commanded them, all I command them. And any man who will not listen to the message which he delivers in my name, I will drive out from my people. So here again, if you're part of the twelve tribes and you don't want to listen to it, you end up uh, just basically in this group of tares because he's got all the information you need to know if you don't uh, want the spirit of Christ, which he's already said can you know, produce everlasting life. You can say, well, all this is old stuff. It's just stories. But uh, I understand that thought. But, uh, I mean, you have to repent. You have to have a desire for Christ. And basically, uh, God himself has to draw you to Christ and that kind of thing. So, it's, uh, I guess, not for everyone, if you want to look at it that way. Even if you're part of the 12 tribes, obviously. The interesting point about that, about the 12 tribes, and what he said, uh, this, he said he would remove their names from the book. Every time he mentions that, he says that they'll take their names out of the book of life. Meaning that their names were already in the book. He had to take them out because of their unbelief and because of their uh, fact that they wouldn't follow his law and just wouldn't obey his commands. They had to, he had to take their name out. So we're not trying to get our names written in the book of life. We're trying to keep from getting our names taken out of the book of life. That's the opposite context. But if you look at it again, that is the way it states it, that he'll remove their names from the book of life. You don't remove their name unless their name is already in the book of life. So I think we should look at it from that aspect. So, uh, if your name's already there and you just want to blow it off, then you can have your name removed. So, I, basically, that's why I've always said that, you know, you can opt out. And that's what you're doing. You're, you're opting out. You already have something. You're saying, oh, I don't want it. I don't want everlasting life. I don't want to uh, follow his law and so forth. So, I wrote on there uh, at the end that only the 12 tribes were expecting Christ. And that's true. Uh, who else? Yeah, you know, especially as I said in Daniel uh, 9.24, who, it gives you the when he was going to be born and then when he was going to die. So who would be expecting a Redeemer to come and then uh, die? And how would that uh, affect their redemption? So unless they understood the scriptures to some extent and they were members of the 12 tribes, who would be expecting Christ? No one. I just can't see anyone expecting that. So, Matthew 14, 22 to 36. So, we left off at 14. Hmm. Yeah, that's where he uh, walks on water. We got in the boat to proceed to the other side. A storm came up. And Christ comes walking out. We all know that story. And it says as many as, uh, when he got to the other side, as many as, as, of course he was curing people from sickness. It says even those that touched the hem of his cloak were restored to health. So, since Christ walks on water, he lulled the wind, or slowed the wind. There's two miracles, plus he states, I am. <sighs> and it says, I live, that's verse 27. So, he's, he's telling them that's, uh, that's himself. Let's look at the other in Mark. Uh, 6.45 and actually uh, since my camera is still on the bottom I'm going to have to move it over and reposition it
Okay. Sorry for that. Just a little more effort to do that one on one. All right, mark 645 to 50. Yeah, there in Mark actually it says, I am. Take courage, I am. Do not be afraid. It says they have degenerate hearts. John uh, 6 15 to 40. So let's go back to John 6 15 to 40. Starts out saying that uh, you know, we had just read that in the prophet who was come it says Jesus perceiving they were about to come and seize him for the purpose of making him king he withdrew himself again John says I am verse twenty. And then, of course, the other people uh, didn't see him leaving the boat. So they're like, uh, so he's talking to these people. Well, they're searching for him, but they didn't see him leaving the boat. But he says, you, you have eaten of the bread and been satisfied. And that's why you're basically following me around to get more. Uh, you're striving for per perishable food, it says. So strive not only for that, but also for the lasting, for that lasting into eternal life which the Son of Man will give to you, for him has God the Father marked out. What must we do to carry out the purposes of God? This is the purpose of God, Jesus answered, that you believe in him whom he sent. They said, what evidence then do you produce that we may see it and confide in you? What can you do? Our forefathers ate the manna in the desert, as it is written. So, how would they quote, that's Psalms 78.2 that's quoting there. He gave them bread to eat from out of heaven. So how would they be able to quote that unless they were pretty knowledgeable scripture? I don't know uh, how many people today would just know that and be able to quote that. Of course, maybe that's not quite the way it worked out, but uh, that's the way it's written here. If you read it, it just appears that, you know, they're quoting a verse. At any rate, it says, I tell you, surely Moses did not himself give you that bread from heaven, but my Father will give you the real bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who descends from heaven and gives life to the world. I say, Give us this bread always. Jesus answered, I am the bread of life. The one who comes to me will never hunger. The one who believes in me will never thirst. I have also told you, all you have, though you have seen, yet you have not believed. Everyone whom the Father gives to me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will not cast out. So there's multiple uh, things in here. Everyone whom the Father gives to me. So there's multiple things in here where he mentions that, uh, you know, that, that decision's from God, and God will drag you to Christ and that kind of thing. So if you're not uh, ordained for it, that message, then... I don't know, but it does give us that idea that he's, all that's uh, predetermined in a sense, you could look at it that way. So the intention of my sender being God, that all which he has entrusted to me, I shall lose nothing, but should restore it at the last day. And he mentions that again in another place uh, in prayer. And of course, the Jews mutter, uh, I am the, saying that I am the bread, no one's able to come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. And that's verse 44. So I said uh, 22 to 36, and then I went a little bit uh, beyond that. 
Uh, but that's alright because the next one starts at uh, 15 9, so. Fifteen to forty. Yeah. Okay. So it says the crowd from the other side of the lake equals the uh, people, or in other words, the five thousand he fed the previous day. Who were looking for more uh, free food, but claiming they were the posterity of the twelve tribes in the desert, which they may have been. And then they quote Psalm seventy-eight twenty-four. Everyone whom the Father gives or entrusts to me will be redeemed at the last day. And of course the last day is Judgment Day. No one is able to come to me unless the Father who sent me draws or drags him as prophesied in Isaiah 54.13, which is an idea of the standard. So let's look at Isaiah 54.13. We already did. That was uh, for whatever reason. We just went through that. I guess on this video, I must be uh, losing track here someplace. I know I just went over Isaiah, even though I don't see it on my list right now. I just went over this. So we'll end it with that, and we'll come back with, uh, you can tell when I'm getting tired, video 19, and we'll come back at uh, Matthew 15, 1-9 on video 19. So thanks for watching.